Readings of Almighty God's Words The Responsibilities of Leaders and Workers The Responsibilities of Leaders and Workers 26 When it comes to the type of people who are revealed and eliminated, the manifestations of their various evil deeds, as well as the malicious words and utterances they reveal in their daily lives, are plain to see. And yet, some leaders and workers are incapable of discerning these evil people for what they really are or seeing through to their nature essence. These leaders and workers seem unaware that they are evil people and disbelievers, and so they have no plans of cleansing them away from the church or of dealing with them appropriately. This is a serious dereliction of duty on the part of a leader or worker. They look on with open eyes as these people with demonic nature do not abide by any of the rules of the house of God, as they run amuck and wantonly disturb and sabotage the work of the church and the order of church life. They even indulge these people when they act boldly and recklessly, behave lawlessly, and harm the interests of God's house under the banner of doing their duty. Harming the interests of the house of God covers many things. Damaging the machinery and various equipment of God's house, damaging its various office appliances and supplies, even squandering God's offerings as they will, and so on. More serious, is that they wantonly release various heresies and fallacies, causing such a disturbance that God's chosen people can't do their duties in peace, such a disturbance that people who are weak and negative abandon their duties and lose faith in following God. These evil people do all these bad things, they commit all these evil deeds that disturb and disrupt the work of the church and bring harm to the brothers and sisters. Yet the leaders and workers turn a blind eye, a deaf ear. Some of them even say, I wasn't aware, no one ever told me. That gang of beasts and devils has wrought havoc, unleashing chaos in the church. Yet the leaders and workers are completely uninformed and unaware of it. Are they not scum? Where are their hearts? What are they doing? Are they not just engaging in idle chatter? Are they not neglecting their proper tasks? Each day that such false leaders are on the job, is one more day for all manner of evil people to disturb the church recklessly and harm God's chosen people. It's because the false leaders don't fulfill their responsibilities that that gang of beasts loafs about idly all day long, not doing any duties or following any rules, mooching off of God's house, freely enjoying the various material benefits and welfare of God's house. They even deliberately disturb the work of the church, damaging the machinery and equipment of God's house. This is how they act, and yet they still expect to live leisurely lives and do whatever they please in the house of God, with no one allowed to bother or provoke them. This is such a grievous issue, yet the leaders and workers brush it aside, not resolving it even when reported on by others. Are they not trash that does no real work? Is this not a serious dereliction of duty? Some say, I didn't solve the problem because I was busy with other work. I just couldn't get around to it. 
Do these words hold water? Just what are you so busy with? If you do not solve such a serious problem, is there value to the matters you are busy with? Are you able to prioritize your work? Shouldn't solving problems take precedence, however busy with work you happen to be? Promptly understanding and dealing with the various kinds of people who disrupt and disturb the church's work is the responsibility of leaders and workers. If you put aside real problems and busy yourself with other matters, are you doing real work? If you discover an issue or someone reports an issue to you, you should put aside the task at hand and immediately go on site and see what the source of the problem is. If it's some evil person disturbing and disrupting the church's work, you should first cleanse this evil person away. After that, solving other problems will be easy. If you discover a problem and don't fix it, claiming that you are too busy, are you in fact not just rushing about like a squirrel in a cage? What is it you're so busy with anyway? Is it real work? Can you explain it clearly? Do your reasons and excuses hold water? Why do you treat solving problems as unimportant? Why don't you solve problems in a timely manner? Why do you find excuses and wriggle out of things, saying you're too busy to take care of them? Is this not being irresponsible? As a leader in the church, not prioritizing problem solving, busying oneself with various trivial matters, failing to recognize the existence of critical problems, being unable to distinguish the importance and urgency in work and grasp the crucial points. These are manifestations of an exceptionally poor caliber, and such a person is a muddler. However many years they've been a leader, they aren't able to perform the church's work well. They should admit responsibility and resign. If a leader has excessively poor caliber, any training is useless. They will definitely be incapable of accomplishing any work. They are a false leader who must be dismissed and reassigned. When false leaders are at work, what are the consequences? Objectively speaking, everything false leaders do brings multifaceted losses to the church. For one thing, the essential work of the church is not done well, directly impeding the effectiveness of the various items of the church's work. At the same time, it also harms and impacts the life entry of God's chosen people. Most crucially, it affects the spread of the kingdom gospel. These consequences are all directly related to false leaders not doing real work. To put it more clearly, all these are caused by false leaders not engaging in real work. If other leaders and workers can actively engage in some real work, accelerating the pace and shortening the lead time on problem solving, wouldn't the various losses inflicted on God's house by false leaders be mitigated somewhat? They could at least be reduced. Even if God's house does not require you to handle issues immediately as they arise, at a minimum, once problems are reported, you should start addressing them immediately. Inquire about the situation from the brothers and sisters and discuss and fellowship with other leaders and workers on how to solve the problems. If the issue is serious and you don't know how to resolve it, you should promptly report it upward and seek solutions. 
This is what all leaders and workers should achieve. But the current problem is that these leaders and workers, even if they cannot solve problems, do not report upward. They are very afraid of reporting upward for fear of betraying their own incompetence, excessively poor caliber, and inability to do real work. They are worried about being dismissed. Yet, they do not take the initiative to work. They are dull-witted and numb and slow to act. Without a path to solving problems, they just muddle along leading to a buildup of too many unresolved issues, thus providing evil people with opportunities. At this time, seeing that the false leaders are good for nothings, those evil people and those with ambitions seize the opportunity to wantonly commit evil deeds, plunging the church into chaos and disorder, paralyzing all aspects of work. Although false leaders should bear the primary responsibility, other leaders and workers have also not fulfilled their responsibilities. Isn't this a serious dereliction of duty by the leaders and workers? In fact, most of the problems that arise in the church are directly related to the disturbances caused by evil people and disbelievers. If the leaders and workers cannot promptly identify the root of the problems, cannot find the chief culprits who are causing the problems, and always look for reasons elsewhere, then they will not be able to fundamentally solve the problems, and problems will continue to emerge in the future. If the troublemakers or those who create problems behind the scenes are caught and held directly accountable. This way of handling problems is the most effective. At the very least, it ensures that those disbelievers and evil people dare not continue to run amok and cause disruptions and disturbances. Isn't this what leaders and workers should achieve? It can be definitively said that the main reason the church's problems are growing in number and do not get resolved in a timely manner is due to the irresponsibility of leaders and workers or because false leaders lack the truth reality and cannot do real work. If leaders and workers cannot solve the various problems that arise in the church, they definitely cannot perform the work inherent to their positions. There are several situations and reasons that must be clearly understood here. If the leaders and workers are novices without experience, they should be patiently helped, led to solve problems, and in the process of solving problems, learn some things and grasp the truth principles. This way, they will gradually learn to solve problems. If the leaders and workers are not the right people, utterly refusing to accept the truth, and instead using the viewpoints and methods of non-believers to solve problems, this does not conform to the truth principles. Such people are not suitable to be leaders and workers and should be dismissed and eliminated in a timely manner. Then, a do-over election should be held to choose suitable leaders and workers. Only this approach can thoroughly solve the problem. Being a church leader is not an easy task, and it is inevitable that some problems cannot be handled. However, if one possesses reason when faced with problems that one cannot solve, one should not hide or suppress the problems and ignore them. Instead, one should consult with several people who understand the truth to collectively find a solution, 
which might resolve 70 to 80 percent of the problems, at least preventing major issues from arising temporarily. This is a viable path. If the problems truly cannot be solved, then one should seek solutions from the above, which is a wise choice. If, because you fear losing face, or fear that the above will prune you for your incompetence, you conceal and do not report the problems. This is being entirely passive. If you act like a numb, dull-witted fool, being at a loss of what to do, this will delay matters. Such situations easily provide opportunities for evil people and antichrists allowing them to take advantage of the chaos to act. Why say they take advantage of the chaos to act? Because they are waiting for precisely this opportunity. When leaders and workers are unable to handle any problems and God's chosen people are feeling anxious and uneasy and have already lost trust in them, Evil people and antichrists are looking to exploit this gap. They think that the church is in a state of having no leadership or management. They want to take this chance to show off their abilities to make God's chosen people look up to them, support them, and believe that compared to the leaders and workers, they have better caliber they are more capable of solving problems and leading the way out and can better turn the tide amid the chaos. Isn't this what evil people and antichrists most want to do? At this time, when the leaders and workers are powerless and evil people and antichrists stand up and solve the problems, even leading the way out, whom will God's chosen people believe? Naturally, they will believe in the evil people and the forces of antichrists. What does this show? It shows that the leaders and workers are good for nothings and accomplish nothing, failing at crucial moments. Are such people still worthy of being leaders and workers? Although the Antichrists lack the truth reality and cannot do real work, they all possess some gifts to varying degrees and are relatively more astute about external matters, which precisely constitutes their advantage and is how they can mislead people. But if they were to become leaders and workers, could they really use the truth to solve the problems of God's chosen people? Could they truly lead God's chosen people to eat and drink God's words, understand the truth, and enter into the truth reality? Absolutely not. Although they have some gifts and are eloquent, they lack any truth reality whatsoever. Are they fit to be leaders and workers of the church? Not at all. This is something God's chosen people should see through. They must never be misled or taken in by evil people and antichrists. Disbelievers, evil people, and antichrists do not pursue the truth at all and do not have even a bit of the truth reality. So tell me, can they say something with conscience and reason? Like, even though the church has no one in charge now, we must act on our own initiative. The regulations of God's house cannot be broken. The principles required by God's house cannot be changed. We should do what we ought to do. Everyone should keep to the duties they ought to do, perform their responsibilities, and not disrupt order? Could they say something like this? Absolutely not. 
What actions will these disbelievers and evil people take? Without oversight and supervision, they do not even do their duties, indulging in eating, drinking, playing, and having fun, engaging in idle chatter, joking around, and even flirting. Some spend the entire night watching videos of the world of non-believers, then use the excuse of having stayed up late doing their duties to slack off and sleep excessively. These are the actions of evil people, those who belong to the category of devils. When they commit these bad deeds, do they feel any guilt? Will they suddenly grow a conscience and take the initiative to fulfill some human responsibilities and do something beneficial for God's house, the church, and the brothers and sisters? Absolutely not. When someone is watching, they reluctantly do some work that makes them look good just to scrape by for a meal. This is the only thing they can do. Besides this, these people have not a single redeeming feature. So, is there any point in these people staying in God's house? There is no point at all. Such people are superfluous and must be cleansed away. How do you measure whether someone loves the truth? Let me give you an example to understand. Some people are involved in a profession, and the more they learn, the more they advance their studies, the more they understand, then the more they are willing to engage in it, and the less willing they are to leave the profession. What kind of manifestation is this? Does this mean that they truly like this profession? No matter how much hardship they endure, no matter the price, no matter how much effort they put in, they continue in the profession without regret, undeterred. This is true affection, a deep, heartfelt liking. Suppose there is someone who claims to like a certain job, but is unwilling to endure hardship, or pay the price during the process of learning professional skills. And when many problems arise at work, they do not seek solutions, fearing trouble, and even often feel that engaging in this profession is a hassle or burden. However, changing professions is not easy, and considering the material benefits that this profession can bring, this person reluctantly engages in it but will never become a standout in this profession. So, do they truly like this profession? They obviously do not. There's another type of person, one who verbally expresses fondness for a certain profession and engages in it, but never endures hardship or pays a price to learn professional skills well. They may even develop repulsion or loathing for the profession during the learning process, becoming increasingly unwilling to learn. When their repulsion reaches a certain level, they switch careers and afterward are unwilling to mention any process, stories, or anything else from when they were engaging in that profession. Do such people truly like the profession? They do not like it. They can easily give up on the profession and feel disgusted and even switch careers, which proves that they don't truly like the profession. The reason they can abandon the profession is that after investing a lot of time, energy, and cost, the profession did not allow them to live the wealthy life they wished for or enjoy good material treatment. They become averse to and curse the profession in their heart, even forbidding others from mentioning it, not mentioning it themselves anymore, 
and even feeling ashamed for having previously engaged in this profession and considered it as their ideal and the highest goal to pursue in life. Given the extent to which they can be averse to the profession, was their initial display of fondness for the profession genuine? No. There is only one type of person who truly likes the profession. Regardless of whether the profession provides them with a good material life or substantial benefits, and no matter how many difficulties they encounter or how much suffering they endure in this profession, they can persevere in it undeterred to the very end. This is true fondness. The same applies to whether a person loves the truth. If you truly love positive things, progressing from loving positive things to loving the truth, then no matter what situations you encounter, you will persist in seeking and pursuing the truth without changing your life's goal. If you can casually give up believing in God and abandon the path to salvation, this is not truly loving the truth. As for those who do not pursue the truth, but also do not give up, there is only one reason for their perseverance. They think that as long as there is a glimmer of hope for a good outcome and destination, a good future, it's worth taking a gamble, and they should persevere to the end. They believe this perseverance is necessary it just so happens that disasters are growing and there's nowhere else to go. So they might as well stick it out here and try their luck. Do such people have even a bit of love for the truth in their hearts? They do not. When they first begin believing in God, these people also speak of hating the world, hating Satan, hating negative things, loving positive things, and longing for light. But what is their behavior when they step into God's house, into the church? What is their attitude when they discover they are laborers, when they realize that their actions, behaviors, and nature are displeasing to God? What kinds of behaviors do they display? It can be said that when they sense, feel, or think that they are no longer favored in God's house, that they are to be eliminated, some choose to leave. Others, though they reluctantly stay in the church, give themselves up to despair and are ultimately forced to leave. Such people do not love the truth at all. When their desire for blessings is shattered, they can betray God and turn away from Him. These various manifestations show the attitudes of different people toward the truth. 4. The Different Outcomes of These Three Kinds of People Just now, we fellowshiped about the characteristics of three types of people laborers, hired workers, and God's people. From their characteristics, it is clear that their ultimate outcomes are not determined by objective environments or conditions, but by their own pursuits and their nature essence. Of course, objectively speaking, it is God who determines people's fates. But God makes these determinations based on whether people love the truth and whether they are able to accept the truth. Laborers also profess to love the truth and positive things. But by the end, when God's work concludes, their notions and imaginings about God, their extravagant demands on God, and their betrayal of God remain unchanged. This is because, during the period of God's work, in the process of following God, 
and doing their duties, they will never have resolved their corrupt dispositions. The root cause of their not addressing their corrupt dispositions is that they fundamentally do not accept the truth. Although they have the desire to submit to God, what they truly manifest is only an ability to forsake and a willingness to pay a price without ever seeking the truth principles or the way of submission to God. The ultimate result is that despite exerting a lot of effort, they have not the slightest knowledge of God. They are still capable of betraying God and voicing their notions and imaginings about Him and their unreasonable demands of Him in front of other people and Satan. When God's work concludes, they still consider themselves as having good humanity, truly believing in God, being able to forsake and endure hardship, and surely being able to be saved. And for this, they feel at peace. In actuality, they have always walked the path of a laborer without pursuing the truth at all. Thus, they always retain the identity of a laborer. As for another category of people, hired workers, we won't discuss them. Still, another category is God's people, whom we just mentioned. Over the course of following God, they, like laborers, expend themselves for Him, dedicate their time and energy, and even their youth, and undergo a lot of suffering and pay a lot of price. This is the same as laborers. What is different then? It is that when God's work concludes, their numerous notions, imaginings, and extravagant demands of God will have been addressed. The manifestations, states, and revelations of corruption that obviously resist God within their corrupt dispositions will have been cast off. Those not yet resolved will dissolve as they gradually come to understand the truth through experience. Although their corrupt dispositions will not have been completely cast off, their life dispositions will have undergone some changes. Most of the time, they'll be able to practice according to the truth principles they understand, and the revelations of their corrupt dispositions will have significantly decreased. Although it's not the case that they won't reveal them in any environment, these people will have met one fundamental requirement. They will have met God's requirement that they be honest. They will basically be honest people, Furthermore, when these people reveal corrupt dispositions or commit transgressions or harbor notions and rebellions against God, regardless of the environment in which they do, they will have a repentant attitude. And there's another point that's most important. Whatever specific actions God takes, and however he acts in the work of judgment of the last days, whatever he intends to do in the future, however he will arrange the fate of humankind, and however they themselves will live in the environment he arranges, they will all possess a submissive heart and an attitude of submission, free of personal choices and free of personal plans and designs. Due to these various proactive and positive manifestations, they will have already become the kind of person God requires, one who follows God's way, which is to fear Him and shun evil. Although they will still be far from the true standard, fear God and shun evil and be a perfect man, as stated by God, when God's trials come upon them, 
they will be able to seek and submit, which is sufficient. They will have no complaints. They'll only wait and submit. Although your current situations may still be a ways off from such a result, and for some, it may seem very distant and unreachable. If you can accept the truth and treat God's words as your principle and foundation for existence, then believe that one day you or all of you will no longer be far from becoming the true people of God whom He loves. Believe that that day is in sight. Whether it is currently prophesied or is in sight, the ultimate result is not a fantasy in either case, but a fact that is about to be realized and fulfilled. Who exactly this fact will be fulfilled in, which people it will be fulfilled in, depends on how you actually pursue the truth. In other words, whether you truly love the truth to the extent that you can pursue and practice it, or you only have a bit of love for the truth but cannot fully accept and practice it, the final result will provide the answer to you. All right, we'll conclude our fellowship on this topic here.